So I'm, uh, I'm Stefan Jure, and um, I am the owner and manager of Jure LLC Attorneys, and I do um, owner yacht warranty claims. And in the summer of 2015, um, I did a two-week federal jury trial, and my uh, client was awarded a $1,063,000 judgment. And um, I'd be very happy to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, what it is that I do, talk a little bit about uh, that case and how we were able to get uh, a high uh, award and some of the evidence that we put on in front of the jury. And the other thing that I think would be useful is to, to talk a little bit about you know, how that experience and some of the things that I learned doing that case, because the case took five years. So the case was initially filed in 2011, and we used six experts in connection with the case. And the process of doing all of that um, allowed me to see where I think um, there are probably other instances in which yacht owners um, buy a vessel. It doesn't have to be a new vessel. In some instances, it could be a used vessel. And they might also have protections of, um, of legislation that probably most of us have never heard of, one of which is the 1975 Federal Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, which is a federal lemon law. And it provides for, in some instances, attorney fee shifting, meaning that if you have a warranty claim on, that's covered by that federal statute, you can sue anywhere in the country in state court or federal court in certain circumstances, and if you win, uh, the other side might have to pay your legal fees. And um, that's a specific component of that statute that's designed to encourage sellers of products in the United States to stand by warranty promises that they make. And um, one of the things that I think is a potentially valuable service for a yacht owner is the ability to pick up the phone and call someone like me and to tell the story about what may be happening with their vessel. Because we all have common sense. And, you know, we know that if you buy a vessel, and, you know, these vessels are often very expensive. They can get into, you know, seven and eight figures pretty, pretty easily. And while we know we don't live in a perfect world and that there will be problems with things, you know, that we buy, what you can expect is that the seller um, of a vessel of that nature that has a warranty will stand behind that warranty and will behave in an honorable way and that they will step up to the plate and address the problem in a timely and reasonable and complete way. And when they don't do that, that's when someone like me gets involved. Um, and, you know, the process would be basically an evaluation of what's going on a look at the contract documents to see what the warranty says, and we can go through a, the warranty language that was applicable in the, the 2015 case uh, that, that basically yielded that large judgment. Um, it's really a function of what the seller promised, and then an uh, overlay of well, what happened after, the story of what happened after, and then the two parts of that um, yields the, the judgment. So the process would be, you take a look at the, the contract documents, you take a look at the, um, the statutory provisions that govern. If it's here in Massachusetts, uh, you would look at um, Chapter 93A, uh, which is the state version, uh, it's called the Little FTC Act, um, and it's the uh, Federal Trade Commission um, sets forth you know, standards for conduct business and obviously you can't commit an unfair deceptive act in commerce uh, and so we have a federal act and we also have state acts that uh, that replicate portions of the federal act they provide for fee shifting as well they also provide if a violation is knowing or willful or there's a failure to uh, settle on reasonable terms after notice was provided that's the demand letter then 
uh, they may face treble damages. So if you can prove $50,000 of harm as a result of something that happened to you with regard to your vessel, it might go up to $150,000 plus your attorney's fees. And that fact is something that ought to make a seller of a vessel uh, concerned. Because if you have somebody that brings in a lawyer that knows what these statutes provide and knows something about vessels and how they operate, then that's a pretty dangerous thing. Um, it's also a pretty useful thing for an owner uh, because it can be the case that you spend a lot of money on something and while you, you know, are sensible and expect that, you know, not, we don't always live in a perfect world and there may be a problem, you certainly can expect a seller to stand by their warranty in an honorable way. And um, one of the things that's, I think, a very valuable thing is the ability to get a second opinion on something. So an ordinary course of events that you could imagine, and it doesn't have to be with a sailboat or a motorboat or any kind of, you know, um, uh, vessel on the high seas. It, it could be something as simple as a car. And... Um, you know, I had a friend uh, a week ago that was telling me about his Audi A3. And he had been in a, a little fender bender. And he had taken it to get fixed. And they did some body work on it. And he said that it seemed fine, it looked great, but that he noticed that when he was driving it at 80 miles an hour that it was shaking. And it hadn't done that before. He took it back to the dealer. And they said, well, you know, we test drove it and we think it's fine. And you sort of know, as the owner, that that's not right. It's just not supposed to shake like that. So on my urging, he went back again and said, I'm not happy. Make it right. And they went back and looked at it again. They must have had a different tech go in. Or they took it maybe more seriously because somebody was going back again. And they said, it's not been aligned properly. So they did the repair work, and now I have a happy friend who is driving at 80 or 90, and it's you know, smooth and steady the way it should be. If you have some part of your vessel, these are highly, highly complicated you know, machines that have all thousands of different components, and when those components don't integrate very well, um, then you can end up with failures. And if you end up with failures that you think probably ought not be happening, you have to be very careful about listening to the seller because the seller is a very interested party and they effect, in effect have a conflict of interest. In a, in a way, they have an incentive to make you think everything's fine just like the Audi dealer and they are not necessarily having your best interests at heart. So that's where you go and get a second opinion. And let's say it's a motor component. Um, something's, you're, not, you, you're not satisfied with the thrust that the engine is, is giving. But you're not an engineer, and you don't know anything about cavitation or any of these complex scientific issues. Um, you could listen to what the seller is saying, and they'll say things like, you know, oftentimes, you know, this is proper levels of cavitation, and the thrust is proper, and it is what it is. And you could then go to someone like me who could put you in touch with one of the, the experts in the field. In this case, in 2015, we used an outfit um, out of New Hampshire, and this is what they do. They're experts in propulsion, in marine propulsion. And they did tests, and their you know, tests were, there's a problem with the, uh, you know, the, the components in this uh, propulsion system. And he testified at the trial about what his findings were, how he did his process, and uh, the conclusions that he reached, and what he thought you know would be a, a different and better way to do it. And getting someone like that involved to just give you a second opinion um, is actually not only a very sensible thing to do, but it's also um, it's also something that can give you peace of mind, because if you're hearing something that doesn't make sense, the car is shaking at 80 mile an hour. They're, ten, they're saying that it's supposed to shake and that it's functioning properly. Well, if I go hire someone else that you know, is not the seller or the servicer, and they drive it at 80 miles an hour, and they say, you know, they're right. It should. This is, proper, this is, a, this is an acceptable level 
of shake, then you at least have that comfort that, okay, you know, two experts are saying it's fine. I guess it probably is fine. When you get that disconnect, though, that's where the lawyer comes in and says, no, here's the information that this expert developed, and we think there's a warranty problem. And when there's a warranty problem, all these other consequences can come into play. I mean, warranties are not um, absolute. Um, you know, you were telling me about a scenario in which somebody had a problem with a motor on a, on a vessel, and, you know, one material fact turned out to be it, it might be that the problems happened after the warranty was over. So in this case in 2015, there was a three-year stem to stern full warranty. If the problems had materialized at three years and one day, or four years out, or six years out, that is not a covered item. In, in this case, there were, um, there were a series of major problems right out of the gate. Uh, in fact, um, after uh, the closing on the vessel, and the title, you know, changed hands, and my owner departed uh, for a trip down to the Caribbean from Fort Lauderdale. Within five hours, um, there were significant problems. Um, uh, there was a hydraulic leak. It spilled hydraulic oil all over the deck, and he had to return to Fort Lauderdale for, um, for repairs. It's five hours after <laughs> He took, you know, possession of the two and two and a half million dollar vessel. Then there were a cascade of problems after that. This vessel was plagued with problems for over a year. And while the seller did make some efforts to try and deal with some of the problems, we presented our case to a federal jury, and the federal jury came back and said there were breaches of the implied warranty of merchantability. Um, the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, and also a breach of this express warranty uh, that we could take a look at. In this case, um, this is a page from the sales contract, and in this particular paragraph, this is paragraph 10, this is, uh, this is the warranty provision. That's a very simple looking paragraph. It's only one, you know, it's only one paragraph, but inside of this, um, you know, the devil's in the details, uh, and this is an instance where the, the, the seller warranted that this yacht is going to be of excellent quality, of good workmanship and materials, that it was going to be seaworthy and suitable for its intended use of extended ocean cruising. And then there's another part here. They guaranteed that for a period of three years after delivery that they were going to uh, fix any warranty defects or they were going to reimburse the buyer for the cost incurred in fixing it. And what ended up happening is when you have a vessel that's plagued with problems for a year and at the end of the day the owner has to go and replace the boom and spend $130,000 doing it, and they don't reimburse the buyer for the cost incurred in fixing it, that's a warranty problem. And under Massachusetts law, a warranty problem is, uh, if it's a material breach of warranty, it is a Chapter 93A violation. It's an unfair and deceptive act or practice. And, um, and while the court, in our case, did not award our attorney's fees, that issue is now on appeal in the, the First Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals. And we are going to argue that the court should have shifted all the attorney's fees, the reasonable attorney's fees, to the other side. Um, they have to pay that. And they should also consider whether this is a, a knowing or willful violation. Um, and, you know, you think about this, and it would very frequently constitute a knowing or uh, willful violation of a warranty because literally if you have a warranty and it says the tires aren't going to fall off of this car and the tires fall off and you tell the seller the tires fell off of the car and the seller says we're not going to do anything about it, it would seem to me very logical that they have knowingly and willfully violated the warranty. So if you have $100 of damage 
that you can show resulted from the tire falling off, it should be $300 plus all your attorney's fees if they're reasonable. And that fact ought to cause the seller of that car or the seller of a yacht to take that matter very, very seriously. But it has to be teed up in the right way. So you've got to get somebody that has done it. You've got to get somebody that knows about these provisions and knows how to use them and knows what the case law is about other yacht manufacturers that have used them. And they need to write a demand letter. And um, you do that, I think, logically after you take a look at what the warranty is, take a look at what the facts are, and then maybe test some of those facts. Because it, these things are very complicated. Um, I don't pretend to be an engineer, um, but I know how to go find an engineer that does know, uh, you know how to run calculations on loads on uh, a boom, for example. But the idea um, you know, was to basically use this uh, vessel um, to travel across the Atlantic, to go into the Mediterranean, uh, to go all through the Caribbean um, and to be able to use it for uh, the intended purpose which was a blue water cruiser. Um, you ought to be able to sail a vessel like this you know, to Australia and back. Um, so some of the problems, here's, a, here's an image um, of the vessel. We used this uh, in the trial and you know, you're dealing in a case like this, you're going to be dealing with lay people uh, people on the jury that are seated on a jury that may never have been on a sailboat before. And so when you're going to be talking about these kind of complex you know, components, you have to teach them a little bit about what a sailboat is and what the different components are, what a mast is, what a boom is. And so we showed them you know, how uh, the boom is supposed to function, how it captures the wind, how it, um, you know, it, it moves. Um, how it unfurls the sail. This is an in-boom furling system that was originally put on this vessel. And so, you know, we did teach them a little bit about what, you know, what the functions are supposed to be on, on one of these vessels. We also teach them about various other parts of it. So you have a connection between uh, the, the boom and the mast, um, and you've got these various components, um, and you've got this uh, this wrap plate, and you've got the vang, and we talk about what a vang is and what it does. Then you've got the furling mechanism and a ratchet and pawl assembly. Um, another area of problems on this vessel, there were um, hydraulic problems. Um, here are all the hydraulic uh, components on the vessel. Another area uh, was the propulsion system. And then what we did is, you know, we, we basically went through a story talking about what happened. And so here the boom falls off the mast. And look at that. That's only a few days after the, uh, the delivery was made. Now, anybody that has ever sailed before knows that the boom on a sailboat is the very heart of the vessel. Um, it, it's like it's it's literally like the steering wheel on a car. It is essential, and for that to fall off with that kind of a warranty that we just saw, uh, well, this is what the jury saw as well. So, here's two and a half weeks for repairs. Here's another departure. Um, here's five weeks troubleshooting hydraulics and charger problems. This green chart was where he wanted to go and where he had planned to go. You know, he was going to go all the way over here, um, and he wasn't able to. He wasn't able to do that. Instead, he departs Grenada, and he's got the boom falling off again. He's got to go back for repairs. Six weeks spent repairing hydraulics and boom. You can't be a seller of a vessel at two and a half million dollars or two hundred thousand dollars and expect that you have a warranty that says it's um, you know it's of good quality and excellent materials and it's fit for its intended purpose of extended ocean cruising he can't get across 
That's not extended ocean cruising. This is somebody that has to always be in port on repairs. So we went through this, and as you can see, I won't go through everything here, but there were just a series of problems. Um, this is a vessel that I argued was plagued with, with problems. This is the case that we presented to the jury, and the jury agreed with us. Um, there ended up having a new boom installed. You can't have that kind of a warranty. And again, the warranty was for three years. And look at all of the problems that happened. So again, in the, uh, in the context of, uh, of showing the, the jury these things, we focus in on particular problem areas. This was a particularly difficult uh, part of uh, this construction in the sense that, uh, you know, we argued that this was under-engineered. And, um, you know, here is, here is actually the gooseneck. Uh, or this piece of the clevis, um, which is attached to the gooseneck. And we show what it looks like on the actual vessel. And it connects to the boom toggle. And you can see all of the different pieces. So this is part of the process of educating a jury that's not going to be very familiar. They will never have seen something like this, um, this kind of an assembly before. And so we explode it all out and show them uh, the various parts. And down here in the lower left-hand corner, um, you can see that this is actually um, this part um, of the clevis. And then we showed a sequence about how the seller attempted to deal with it. And they're the seller's uh, contractor. And you can see there were various things that were tried. The vessel was brand new, and it showed up for delivery uh, with these components on it. They did some of these repairs. They, they, uh, they made a number of different uh, attempts to fix it. Um, but that's, you know, that's the question about what, you know, what actually is the duty of a seller when they provide that kind of a warranty. And the we argued, and the jury found that they had breached that warranty language. Because while they made some efforts, the efforts were, I think we proved, unavailing. And I think we also proved that when he finally had the boom replaced, and you can see here, what this shot is, is this is a guy holding up um, the original toggle and the original assembly that includes this clevis. And what is on the vessel behind that is the replacement. And look how much larger that is. And so this underscored, you know, a point that we were making, which is, you know, our, our experts concluded that this original assembly was under-engineered for a 70-foot vessel. And that's the evidence that we put on. Now, you can look at this in, in, in hindsight, and you could say, with all of this evidence, why in the world doesn't a seller look at what the facts are, look at what the law is, and then make a settlement. And, um, you know, I guess we could only ask the seller why they didn't. I don't know why they didn't. I don't think it was a very sound business decision, in my opinion. Um, and it resulted in a $1,063,000 judgment against them. And that's a problem. And... Um, you know, that's not to say uh, that doesn't even factor in all the expense they must have surely incurred because they had a lawyer and a series of lawyers and experts on their own account uh, over a five-year period. So um, difficult set of circumstances for that seller.